My name is Yasmin Smith and I'm um, an artist from Sydney. I am a ceramicist mainly, but I, I concentrate my work on using ceramic glazes as evidence of, I suppose, chemical narratives that exist in particular sites. The process that I undertake is to go to a particular site of interest, um, explore the ecology and the geology and the human history of that site, and then I collect plant specimens from which I will make ceramic replicas in usually stoneware clay. The next step of the process is that I will then burn those branches down, the original specimens, down to ash, and take that ash to create a ceramic glaze that furnishes the outside of the replicas of, of those ceramic branches. There's a variety of different colours that you'll get um, in the glaze, and that's because the ashes of the plants retain inorganic elements that they collect from the soils. So, uh, you know, for example, if a tree is growing in um, the central desert of Australia, it's taking in a lot of iron oxide from the very rich red um, soils there. Um, compared to, say, plant uh, that have been growing in the Paris Basin, which has taken in a lot of calcium, which is one of the, you know, the geological elements of the Paris Basin. So the work is titled Seine River Basin. The form is 44 ceramic tree branches that have been cast from plant specimens that I had collected while I was on residency in, in Paris for five months. I've made one cast of 22 different um, types of shapes of branches, and then I've recast those 22 branches again, but flipped them over as if to sort of give the audience the impression of the reflection of trees on a body of water. I'd been invited to um, participate in um, an exhibition platform called Cosmopolis, which was um, put together by Catherine Weir at the Centre Pompidou. And she'd invited me to China, where I did a two-month residency at the end of 2018 for Cosmopolis 1.5, and then to Paris uh, for Cosmopolis 2, Rethinking the Human. My intention, a very broad intention of the project, was to collect wood from the river systems of the Seine River Basin and the riparian ecology, so that's the riverbank ecology. One of the ecologists that had applied to me um, he, we ended up meeting and collaborating and he took me on a, a tour of the, the River Seine from its spring in, um, near Dijon in Burgundy back to Paris. When I did get to Paris and I found my way into different um, kind of collaborative relationships with people, this just organically led to the selection of locations where I would find wood. So, for example, um, Jean-Francois Asmodet, who was the ecologist that I work with, he had a connection with an NGO that cleaned the River Marne. So that was my first port of call to um, look for some wood. And it was this group that um, provided me with a, a section that became the Marne willow tree glaze and forms. So once I'd found the, the willow from the Marne, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try and find some more willow trees. And through the help of these new friends and relationships that I'd formed, we ended up finding an arborist who had cut down a willow tree from the River Seine, right at the confluence of the River Yone and the River Seine. At the Yone, which is a bit outside, a bit upstream of, of the sort of main hub of Paris, um, I'd collected willow from the banks of the river that had been cut down and had been left by the side of the river in a 60 metre long by 5 metre tall pile of wood. I also collected driftwood that had collected at the uh, ecluse, at the beginning of the lock of the river. The fourth site uh, was actually the St Denis Canal, which is sort of to the north east of Paris city. So it's probably the location of like the most densely populated with human habitation. In terms of its pristineness, you know, it's probably the, the least pristine of all the locations. One of the aspects of the research is not only to look at geology and plant biology, but also to look at human history. So if there's been any activities that have happened at that site, whether, whether that's mining or, 
you know, heavy agriculture or just mass habitation. Um, sometimes humans can leave a chemical trace behind. And quite often, you know, the trees that grow in those areas show evidence of that. And that evidence comes through in this aesthetic glaze representation. For example, um, a, you know, a tree that I did in uh, the flooded forests of Tasmania was a celery top pine and it came out with more of a purple glaze. And purple is indicative of manganese dioxide. Uh, so I got the ashes tested and that's something that I also do with every project is to get the ash tested at a lab for its metal content. And in that particular case, it showed that that plant had more manganese dioxide in it compared to um, iron, for example, which usually iron dominates because it's so ubiquitous in the soils. So I did a little bit of research on manganese dioxide you know, toxicities around that area and, it, and there was quite a, a lot of information gathered since around about 2009 um, in those local towns where there was high levels of manganese dioxide in the lakes and the groundwater due to runoff from local mine tailings, for example. This is an example of a mould that I would make of, of a branch. So this is how it comes in two parts. Once you finish the two halves of the mould, you then remove the original piece and put back the two halves back together. And then I just strap them up. And so this is the front of the mould and the top of the mould and it's actually got a, a hole like which we, which it's called like I suppose the funnel where we'll pour the liquid clay into um, in order for it to set inside in the shape of the internals. And this is the slip, it's, the slip is basically liquid clay. So it's clay that's um, got a deflocculant in it that keeps it um, suspended keeps all the clay particles suspended in a liquid. And that just gets poured straight in the top. And you have to have these tight so that it doesn't explode and clay go everywhere. Oh! And so what will happen is the, the plaster itself is like quite thirsty for water. So it starts to draw the water that's, you know, contained in the clay slurry out of what you've just poured inside. And that We'll st you'll start to see a small film start to gather and the actual the level of the slip will drop. And so over maybe about half an hour period, I just keep topping it up until I'm happy with the thickness that has formed on the drier part of the, of the pour. And basically then I just tip that straight back out and leave it for maybe a day until it gets leather hard and I can open up the mould and take the piece out. This is a triaxial blend and this is the way that I test the ash for the glazes for my work. So the, the recipe that I choose is somewhere in the middle and I use that same recipe from every project to the next, so it really never changes. And that, that way, each glaze from one project is comparable to the next one. This is um, an example of the glaze when it's mixed with water. So in here is the, the ash along with the two other glaze materials. 
And I just take that mixture and, and literally paint it on um, the, the outside of the bisque fired clay. And so when it goes on, it looks, it looks grey. But then when it comes out, once it goes through the firing process um, and all of the glaze melts, that melting helps to show the colours of the metal oxides that were actually inside there. When the ash, um, when I collect the ash, I basically burn it in a non-contaminated environment, so an environment where there's, you know, no rusty bits of metal or anything like that. And I will burn it slowly because if you burn too quickly, you burn away the ash. So I'll burn it over a week or something like that. And then I sieve it in a, I sieve the ash in a, in a spaghetti strainer to get rid of any of the big bits. And then that's it. That's what I basically mix water with for the glaze. There's 61 elements on the periodic table that will have an effect on glazes or ceramic processes. But what, I'm, what the glazes tend to respond most to in terms of chemicals is metals that produce colour. So the work, say in River Basin, has this light yellow colour throughout the whole work. And this is reflective of a very light iron content in the soil. It also has a very matte finish. And that could be due to the extremely high levels of calcium that are found across all four sites, across all four glazes and trees that have grown there. And that calcium is really a very old geological formation. So that's why I get this um, kind of laboratory breakdown. So I actually get 52 elements tested. What this shows me is a sort of a numerical um, ordering of, of, what met, of the amount of metals that are found in each ash. And so from that, I can go back to the glaze aesthetic and draw a sort of comparative narrative between what this empirical evidence says and what, well, what is also in some ways empirical, but interpret interpretive and speculative evidence from the glaze. Some of the, the main um, differences that I found, or interesting differences that I found, was the amount of strontium that was in the Marne and the St. Denis Canal woods, which are closer to the city. There's potential that in areas where there was more habitation, that, that the strontium might be present because of that sort of human activity or input. There's a couple of other really cool examples of that happening with some of my other works. This is actually a pear ash from Shepparton in Victoria. And you can see that it's gone this kind of ready purpley color. Well, this is the pear ash in reduction. So again, this is where the, the flame of, the, of firing the kiln is starved of oxygen and it starts to eat the oxygen out of the, in this case, copper that was in the ash of the pear tree. So when it was fired in oxidation, it was this copper green. And when it was fired in reduction, you got this copper red. And this shows pretty well that example there. That was an interesting story because when I got the, um, when I got the glaze results back from that work and I thought it looked like a copper green, I went and I asked the farmers why there'd be more why there'd be more copper in that glaze, in that, sorry, in that tree. And he told me that until about the 1970s, um, they used to spray this tree with copper oxide to make the fruit go brown. And um, they stopped it, yeah, they stopped it in the 70s, but that orchard was actually 150 years old. So it was subjected to, you know, almost 100 years of being sprayed directly with copper oxide. And that was just retained in the wood. Yeah, making work on a residency like Seine River Basin, um, you know, in, in Paris for five months. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite a difficult experience at first, you know, it's not, it's not easy. But you have, to be, um, you have to be quite open to the world and not too precious about what you thought you might be doing and, and let, let the work or the research evolve depending on what um, is, becomes available to you. I think I was speaking about this before, it's more like a collaboration with the world um, than it is trying to force your entire, you know, push the world into the box that you want to see it through. You know, a lot of, it, a lot of the time I spent in Paris was trying really hard <laughs> to, 
to find materials, to find collaborations and um, spaces to work. And then a lot of luck, I think, um, by putting myself out there, by being um, open to, to new relationships and situations, that sort of allowed me, opened up more opportunities, you know, for the work to, to evolve and to be produced. Um, you know, and you come across major, major difficulties, kilns breaking down, you know, um, having to rely on people you don't know that well is often difficult. Um, but I think in those tough stitch situations, you tend to actually form quite enduring and special relationships with people, yeah.